Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to talk about one truth that will change your life forever. Just one truth. Now, you can argue, well, Steve, there's a lot of truths that can change my life forever, and that's true. Uh, uh, I think that that's why I, I title this uh, One Truth That'll Change Your Life Forever. Uh, you might say, and I wouldn't blame you if you did, uh, you might argue, well, Steve, you know, I, I know one truth that'll change your life forever. Just believe Jesus Christ is Lord. And I would have a difficult time arguing with that. That is an absolute fact. That's one truth that will change your life forever. However, I could argue, I think, that a lot of people who believe Jesus Christ is Lord, their lives are not changed forever. But I can... I believe give you one truth that will change your life or can change your life forever. I want to begin by saying that talking a little I want to talk a little bit about past, present, and future. We as people, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, since the beginning of time, we've dealt with the reality of time, and we live in the present. We always have, and we often discuss things in terms of the past, as well as the present, as well as the future. I think we've had to invent those terms, it's just my personal opinion, in order to make reference to points in the past and points in the future. But I am going to suggest to you folks that the past and the future exist only in our minds. I think the past and the future exists only in our dreams, our hopes, or you could say our memories. But I believe there's a lot of truth to the fact that we live in the constant present. We always have lived in the present, even in the past. And when we uh, step foot into eternity, that place which we now in the present look at as the future, that will become our present. I don't really want people thinking I've just gone kind of Looney Tunes. But I do believe that there is a lot of truth to the fact that the only thing that exists is the present. And ministry, well, I should say just the Christian life in general, uh, generally speaking, Christians often tend to focus on and address uh, present individual actions. You know, uh, Steve, uh, just tell me what, Pastor Steve, just tell me what I should do now. Uh, about some decision in my life, what do you think I should do now? Uh, what does the Bible say that I should be doing now? What do you think... Uh, would please God if I was doing it now. 
I mean, just give me something to do now. And my, my point, I don't want to really preach the point too far, but my point is, is that Christians tend to focus on present individual actions, but I think there's something greater to look at, and I want us to look at, just take a moment, if you would, and just look at uh, your life as a whole. Uh, get your mind away from individual acts at the moment, you know, like I, maybe I should do this, uh, I shouldn't do this. Just look at your life. That's all. Just look at your life. And maybe that's painful for some of you. Maybe that's not so painful. It's painful for some of you. Uh, uh, now, hold on a cotton mi picking minute, Steve. Of course, there's a future. No, there's not. There's only the present. Waiting on eternity is something that we do in the present. Yeah, we look forward to heaven. With great anticipation, we look forward to the rapture of the church. We long to be with the Lord. Those are hopes, dreams, expectations. We know they're in the future so we all, Steve, there must be a future. Yeah, there's surely, there's a past. I mean, I came out of a past. I'm, I've got a, a future ahead of me. What do you mean we're just, it's all, you know, what do you mean when you say that the only thing that exists is the present? Once we step foot into eternity, folks, we will be in the present. There never has been nor shall there ever be anything but the present. The constant present is all we will ever know. We as Christians ex expect, and rightly so, to live forever with our Lord Jesus Christ and with one another to go to heaven, to live in glory. Eternal life. Life without end. You know, as the song says, well, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when, they, than when we first begun. But dearly beloved, it will always be the forever now. And that's kind of the way I want you to approach this message, the, this discussion that I'd like to have with you here. I want you to, to think about your life as a whole. Get a rise above it all. Get a bird's eye view, the, the, the gestalt, as the artist would say, you know, where you see the whole thing. You're not just looking at parts. You're just sort of looking at the whole thing. You're evaluating it as a whole up to now, you know, from, a, from the, your earliest memory as a child to the present. Just get a bird's eye view of the years that you have lived on earth and then ask yourself, how have you in the past, which was in your case always the present, how, how did you look at your life? Or if you prefer, how are you looking at that life that you've lived so far today in the present? How are you looking at, at your life as a whole? Now we've moved away from individual actions. You know, I did this, I, I, I did that, I, I shouldn't have done that, what should I do? We've moved away from individual actions and we've looked at our lives 
at least as we understand it and as we've known it as a whole. Looking back at your life, I know I've, I've had this discussion with others in the past. Oh, Steve, that really scares me. Or, you know, I, I got some PTSD. There's things I don't want to remember. I'm not asking you to share those with anybody. I'm just asking you to evaluate your own life. And let's, let's look at, at your life. And let's look at the bad and let's look at the good. Okay? All right? Uh, the bad. Uh, I think that the bad is a good place to start. Then we'll talk about the good. The common tendency, even among Christians today, is to look at all the bad in their life, all of the failures, all of the letdowns, all of the disappointments, all of the mistakes, what you would consider bad. And I'm, I put bad in quotes, okay? Okay. You know, I blew it. You know, I blew it here, I blew it there, you know, and, and everywhere. Or, or everywhere. Uh, Steve, I went to prison. Uh, I was on drugs, homeless and on drugs. Uh, I ran with gangs, outlaws. I. I had my outlaw years, married the wrong woman. <laughs> I had a spouse die. I had children die. Just think of the you know worst things that's happened to you in your life. Things that you would, uh, most people would typically consider regrets. Uh, I want to, I don't want to rush ahead too fast here. I, I you know, regrets, but I'll, I'm just, I'll, I have to tell you, regrets, dearly beloved, are the very heart of atheism. And I'll explain why. I hope to explain why. When we focus on that, we tend to, and I'm not just talking about the bad, we're gonna to get to the good here. Both are just equally, uh, can be equally misleading, uh, lead us off on, in the wrong direction, you know, depending upon our perspective. Take for example, let's let's talk about some good things, okay? I mean, I got a great job, I got a great family, you know. I've, I, uh, you know, I've, I've been blessed with tremendous health. Uh, uh, I've, I've worked hard. I've gotten, you know, wealthy. I've gotten financially independent. Uh, you know, I'm I'm good at uh, at golf. <laughs> you know, or nobody can beat me. You know, at at uh, uh, as far as uh, your skills go, your talents go, you know, you, you've got some tremendous talents, you've worked hard, you've got a good education. I mean, just you, your life is sort of storybook. I mean, at least it's more, it, it's, it's more storybook lovely than it is devastatingly chaotic. And... So there's not a lot of regrets, but there may be a lot of pride. You know, it's so it's, I did this, I accomplished this, I pursued this, I worked hard for this, I deserve this. So it's kind of a catch 22, it doesn't matter if it's bad or it's good, you know, if it's there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of regrets. 
there's a lot of good. Well, then it's, we attribute all of that success to ourselves on, on how, oh, how, how God just endowed us with such a brilliant mind and a determination to succeed. I want to talk about this truth, this one truth, this, because the effect that this one truth can have in your life is enormous. The reason I know that is because I've seen it time and time again bring peace where the, there was trouble and turmoil. I've seen it change people's lives where that they were happier, more blessed, less sorrowful, uh, less feeling, you know, the feelings of defeat, you know, as if their lives have been a waste. They never accomplished much. You never, you know, succeeded at doing much. There's an age-old controversy, and this is where we're getting to the heart of the matter. If you want to understand this one truth that will change your life forever, you have to face head-on and deal honestly with the question of God's supreme sovereignty over your life. It's an age-old debate because the argument goes something like, yeah, okay, you know, sure, Pastor Steve, I believe God is sovereign. I truly do. But He's also given us a mind, a will of our own. We have free will. And He's, left, he's given us that, that freedom of choice. We can make whatever decisions we want to make. Some of those decisions can be good. Some can be bad. Some can get us, you know, uh, nice things in life. Some can just be devastate, just devastate our life. And and you know, what's wrong with regrets? I think that there's a. If I could use the illustration of just putting on a cloak, okay? Let's. It it's not a. Uh, it's not a matter of really as much of a, I've never been known from illustrations, but let's just say, okay, one is like putting on a black cloak, a black coat, and another is putting on a white coat. You, in looking back at your whole life, are you going to wear the black coat or are you going to wear the white coat? Because if I can promise you that if you wear the wrong coat, if you, if, if you wear the black coat, you're not going to find, ever find the peace, the joy in the Lord, the rest that God's promised you. It really does depend upon how you walk, how you think, how, which affects how you talk. One is going to dictate your every decision in life, one view or the other. I've often used the illustration of a God's sovereign will, His predetermined, foreordained will for not just our lives, but for everything. Just... Picture it as a stream flowing in one direction, one direction only. It's, it's flowing from beginning to end. It's going to achieve the results that God intended regardless of what man does. You have to say that. Otherwise, well, we're, then we're more powerful than God and we can usurp God's authority and we're, we're actually little gods ourselves and you know we you know we can just mess up God's plans ruin God's plans by what we do 
which is a pretty ridiculous notion. To even it's so ridiculous it's too it's too ridiculous to even entertain. Sovereignty, God's sovereignty over here and human volition, human will, freedom of choice, freedom of movement, however you want to express that, it is not a one or the other issue. It's not. It's not. That's we need to get it out of our minds from the outset. It is not a one or the other issue where that only one exists. Both do exist. Okay, I, I have been given by God some measure of freedom. But that measure of freedom, folks, is inseparable from God's sovereignty. Our, our wills only exist within the sphere of God's sovereign will. Everything we do, every thought, every action that we do is swept up in that current of God's will flowing in one direction. You're not going to change the direction of the stream. It is going to arrive at its destined place. You're not going to change it. Change course. The course of... You're not even going to change the course of human history. If, if you think that you've done anything, or if you look at any, anyone who you think has done anything to change the course of human history... It all got swept up in God's sovereign will, His plan toward His predetermined destination for this world and mankind. And this is especially true in the believer's life. Think of, uh, think of it this way. All the decisions that you make, Every single little, little minute detailed decision that you make in life are these things, just little rocks, twigs, uh, uh, pebbles uh, that alongside the bank that, that gets caught up in that stream doesn't change the direction of the stream. doesn't change the direction of the stream. Romans 8.28 says, that, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, not everybody loves God and not everybody is called according to His purpose. But it still, nevertheless, it doesn't mean that the decisions that they make in their lives aren't caught up in that same stream. But all things work together for the good. We are told in Philippians 2.12 to work out our own salvation. That's not redemption. That's our deliverance, ongoing deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, the deliverance that you as a Christian, if, if you are a Christian, that you should uh, long for. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. No wonder it says fear and trembling. Stop for a moment and consider how staggering the thought is that it is God who is working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure, and that applies to the Christian 
who looks back at his life and goes, man, my life was a mess. It also goes the other way. You know, the, the Christian who looks back at his life and, 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 and he says, well, you know, all these successes that I had, you know, it's, you know, the temptation is to give yourself credit for that. When it was God who was at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. Now, do not write me and do not ask me why God chooses to work in one person's life the way that he does and, and not work in another person's life the way that, that, he, that he does. I don't know. I'm not God. I'm not privy to that information. However, I will suggest that God knows exactly what He's doing and He does it perfectly. John chapter 15, 26 tells us when the Comforter is come, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, He shall testify of Me. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't glorify Himself. In fact, He hasn't even revealed His name other than the, the cunt. You could say, well, you could argue with me and say, well, Steve, yeah, He's, the, he's our comforter. There's His name. I, I don't think that's His name. I think that's one of the descriptions given him in, in his activity and his involvement in our lives. He, he is our comforter, but I don't believe that's his name. He hasn't even revealed unto us his name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity has not even revealed his, his name. And he's God Almighty. God of very God. I think... We do well to see how God is stressing the point of just what the Holy Spirit's ministry is in the believer's life. He glorifies Christ. He is not convicting you of sin. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit's not in the business of con convicting Christians of sin. That's not His function. At all. He's our comforter. And if you're not comfort, comforted by the truth, then someone's lying to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is, this is the will of God for you. Steve, I, I just wish I knew what the will of God is. If I only knew what the will of God is. He, he's told you what the will of God is. To give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And dearly beloved, that is impossible to do if God is not sovereign. James tells us in chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. The word temptations is trials, hardships, difficulties. It may include, you know, being tempted to rob a bank or whatever. But, but it's not really the context and it's not really the, the, the underlying meaning of the word, of the term, temptations. The word is trials, testings, okay? You are to count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Again, dearly beloved, that is impossible to do if God is not sovereign. What is the one truth that will change your life forever? What is the one truth that would have changed your life forever? when you look back at your life and how you've lived it, how you perceived it, or how you today in the present look back and, and perceive your life, how you grade it, how you, how you characterize it, define it. Let 
was he sovereign or was he not? Try it just if you can. Just take a moment and try to think back on, look back on, on your past life and then ask yourself, how different would my life have been if I believed the verses I just read you? In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. Everything, Steve? Yeah, everything. I, I did not write those words. He says, in everything, give thanks. That includes your failures, your disappointments, all of these so-called tragedies in your life. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not making light of any hardship, any trial, any tragedy, any devastating, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching trial in your life. I'm not making light of that at all, okay? Not at all. Well, you know, you backed out of, a, you, 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 you were late for work, you ran out the door, you jumped in your car, you backed out of the driveway to get to work, and you ran over your little girl on her tricycle and killed her. Sorry, okay? I'm, I'm really, I say that to, to push the point here. Well, Steve, what are you saying? You're saying that I should, should thank God that I ran over my little girl and killed her. Not really. What I'm saying is, is that in that, for the circumstance that God uh, brought into your life, for whatever reason, only He knows. He asks you to give thanks. It, not only does He ask you to give thanks, He says this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you haven't figured out yet that a an absolute, unwavering, unshakable belief in God's absolute supreme sovereignty alone, just that one truth alone, has the ability to change your life in ways that you probably couldn't imagine, then maybe you need to think about it some more. I look back on my life. I've had a number of, of injuries. I've had a number of tragedies. And my, just like most people, I've had, you know, I mean, I haven't had a, you know. I was in the military. I have, I have you know, it, early on uh, as a Christian, I had a lot of regrets. I had a lot of, you know, hang-ups, if you will. You know, I had a little PTSD. I had, I had this. I had that. I had, but when I came to, to realize how just how supremely sovereign God is in my life. That He doesn't allow anything to touch my life except it be for the ultimate good. My life, when I realized that, dearly beloved, my life was changed forever. And as a result of that, all of these minute detail, all of the, the, the individual actions that you, you know, you tend to think that, you know, you, you ought to, the ways that you ought to function as a Christian and, you know, you should do this and do that and, or don't do this, don't do that. All of that just sort of fell into place. The power of God's, it, it will never cease to amaze me, folks, how that the power of God's Word alone, through one simple truth alone, has the power, has the ability to literally change our lives forever. 